episode 115. They glared at each other. Harry's scars seared again, but he did not care. Snape looked agitated. When he spoke again, he sounded as though he was trying to appear cool and unconcerned. There are many things in the Department of Mysteries, Potter, few of which you would understand and none of which concern you. Do I make myself plain? Yes, Harry said, still rubbing his prickling scar, which was becoming more painful. I want you back here same time on Wednesday, and we will continue work then. Fine, said Harry. He was desperate to get out of Snape's office and find Ron and Hermione. You are to rid your mind of all emotion every night before sleep. Empty it. Make it blank and calm. Do you understand? Yes, said Harry, who was barely listening. And be warned, Potter. I shall know if you have not practiced. Right, Harry mumbled. He picked up his school bag, swung it over his shoulder, and hurried toward the office door. As he opened it, he glanced back at Snape, who had his back to Harry and was scooping his own thoughts out of the pen sieve with the tip of his wand and replacing them carefully inside his own head. Harry left without another word, closing the door carefully behind him, his scar still throbbing painfully. Harry found Ron and Hermione in the library, where they were working on Umbridge's most recent ream of homework. Other students, nearly all of them fifth years, sat at lamp-lit tables nearby, noses close to books, quills scratching feverishly, while the sky outside the mullioned windows grew steadily blacker. The only other sound was the slight squeaking of one of Madame Pince's shoes as the librarian prowled the aisles menacingly, breathing down the necks of those touching her precious books. Harry felt shivery. His scar was still aching. He felt almost feverish. When he sat down opposite Ron and Hermione, he caught sight of himself in the window opposite. He was very white and his scar seemed to be showing up more clearly than usual. How did it go? Hermione whispered, and then, looking concerned, Are you all right, Harry? Yeah, fine. I don't know, said Harry impatiently, wincing as pain shot through his scar again. Listen, I've just realized something. And he told them about what he had just seen and deduced. So, so are you saying, whispered Ron, as... Madame Ponce swept past, squeaking slightly, that the weapon, the thing you know who's after, is in the Ministry of Magic? In the Department of Mysteries. It's got to be, Harry whispered. I saw that door when your dad took me down to the courtrooms for my hearing, and it's definitely the same one he was guarding when the snake bit him. Hermione let out a long, slow sigh. (sighs) Of course she breathed. Of course what, said Ron rather impatiently. Ron, think about it. Sturgis Podmore was trying to get through a door at the Ministry of Magic. It must have been that one. It's too much of a coincidence. How come Sturgis was trying to break in when he's on our side, said Ron. Well, I don't know, Hermione admitted. That is a bit odd. So what's in the Department of Mysteries? Harry asked Ron. Has your dad ever mentioned anything about it? I know they call the people who work there unspeakables, said Ron, frowning, because no one really seems to know what they do in there. Weird place to have a weapon. It's not so weird at all. It makes perfect sense, said Hermione. It will be something top secret that the Ministry has been developing, I expect. Harry... Are you sure you're all right? For Harry had just run both his hands hard over his forehead, as though trying to iron it. Yeah, fine, he said, lowering his hands, which were trembling. I just feel a bit... I don't like occlumency much. 
Well, I expect anyone would feel shaky if they'd had their mind attacked over and over again, said Hermione sympathetically. Look, let's get back to the common room. We'll be a bit more comfortable there. But the common room was packed and full of shrieks of laughter and excitement. Fred and George were demonstrating their latest bit of joke shop merchandise. Headless hats, shouted George, as Fred waved a pointed hat decorated with fluffy pink feathers at the watching students. Two galleons each. Watch Fred now. Fred swept the hat onto his head, beaming. For a second, he merely looked rather stupid. Then both hat and head vanished. Several girls screamed, but everyone else was roaring with laughter. And off again, shouted George, and Fred's hand groped for a moment at what seemed to be thin air over his shoulder. Then his head reappeared as he swept the pink feathered hat from it again. How do those hats work then, said Hermione, distracted from her homework and watching Fred and George. I mean, obviously it's some kind of invisibility spell. But it's rather clever to have extended the field of invisibility beyond the boundaries of the charmed object. I'd imagine the charm wouldn't have a very long life, though. Harry did not answer. He was still feeling ill. I'm going to have to do this tomorrow, he muttered, pushing the books he had just taken out of his bag back inside it. Well, write it in your homework planner, then, said Hermione encouragingly, so you don't forget. Harry and Ron exchanged looks as they reached into his bag, withdrew the planner, and opened it tentatively. Don't leave it till later, you big second raider, chided the book as Harry scribbled down Umbridge's homework. Hermione beamed at him. I think I'll go to bed, said Harry, stuffing the homework planner back into his bag and making a mental note to drop it in the fire the first opportunity he got. He walked across the common room, dodging George, who tried to put a headless hat on him, and reached the peace and cool of the stone staircase to the boys' dormitories. He was feeling sick again, just as he had the night he had had the vision of the snake, but thought that if he could just lie down for a while, he would be all right. He opened the door of his dormitory and was one step inside it, when he experienced pain so severe, he thought that someone must have sliced into the top of his head. He did not know where he was, whether he was standing or lying down. He did not even know his own name. Maniacal laughter was ringing in his ears. He was happier than he had been in a very long time, jubilant ecstatic, triumphant. A wonderful, wonderful thing had happened. Harry, Harry! Someone had hit him around the face. The insane laughter was punctuated with a cry of pain. The happiness was draining out of him, but the laughter continued. He opened his eyes and as he did so, became aware that the wild laughter was coming out of his own mouth. The moment he realized this, it, it died away. Harry lay panting on the floor, staring up at the ceiling, the scar on his forehead throbbing horribly. Ron was bending over him, looking very worried. What happened? he said. I don't know, Harry gasped, sitting up again. He's really... Happy, really happy. You know who is? Something good's happened, mumbled Harry. He was shaking as badly as he had done after seeing the snake attack Mr. Weasley and felt very sick, something he's been hoping for. The words came just as they had back in the Gryffindor changing room, as though a stranger was speaking them through Harry's mouth, yet he knew they were true. He took deep breaths, willing himself not to vomit all over Ron. He was very glad that Dean and Seamus were not here to watch this time. Hermione told me to come and check on you, said Ron in a low voice, helping Harry to his feet. She says your defenses will be low at the moment after Snape's been fiddling around with your mind. Still, I suppose it'll help in the long run, won't it? 